Here at Shortwave Space Camp, we escape our everyday lives to explore the mysteries and quirks of the universe. We find weird, fun, interesting stories that explain how the cosmos is partying all around us. From stars to dwarf planets to black holes and beyond, we've got you. Listen now to the Shortwave Podcast from NPR. This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give, and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. This is kind of wild. Will a robot take my job is one of the most Googled questions. Humans have a conflicted relationship with robots. Some we love, and some we hate. Your clothes, give them to me, now. You asshole. Mostly because we fear them. The rise of robots has led to some pretty scary warnings about the future of work. The robots will be able to do everything better than us. And with the explosion in development of artificial intelligence, that relationship is only getting more complicated. Megan, answer me. What did you do? What did you think was going to happen? I was going to let you decommission me without even talking about it? This is Booming. I'm Joshua McNichols. And I'm Lucy Suchek. In for Monica Nicholsberg. We know robots are getting smarter, but are they making us smarter too? Most of us are already encountering robots in our daily lives. They're toiling in the background. They help make our cars. They vacuum our floors. They move goods around in Amazon warehouses. Yeah, they're good at the boring stuff. Repetitive tasks in predictable environments. The real world is a lot messier. And now AI is helping robots master the mess. So what does that mean for us humans? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Lucy. Yeah. When you think about robots, what comes to mind? Okay, honestly, when I think about robots, I think of just a big pile of metal. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're static, they're inflexible. They just feel so different from humans. Because humans and, like, all of nature, we're dynamic, we change, we can adapt, and robots are just, like, metal. They're just unchanging. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it kind of feels so unnatural to think of us living in the same world together, like, coexisting. Yeah, yeah. Well... You know, it's easy to think of ways that robots and people are different, but AI is changing that, and it's letting robots operate in more chaotic environments, which means we're going to see more robots and humans working together. I found this one example in Seattle at a construction site. I'm on the bus, and I'm headed to downtown Seattle to the Belltown neighborhood, where I'm going to visit a construction site, and I'm headed there because there is a robot there that is doing the job that a person used to do. And I want to know how it works and what it all means and what that worker thinks. So why did you choose a construction site? Because construction sites are complicated environments. They're changing all the time, like a river. Mm. There's safety hazards everywhere. You know, people are leaving tools lying around. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the places we see robots really thriving are pretty predictable places like assembly lines or an Amazon warehouse. Yeah, I feel like that's what I think of when I think of robots. Even roadways, they're essentially a regular system of lines that self-driving cars can follow. And those cars screw up when that environment becomes less predictable, you know, like when a pedestrian jumps in front of them. But here's what's different. Artificial intelligence. As AI improves, it's helping robots function more easily in more chaotic environments. They can be trained not just to navigate, but to recognize what they're seeing and interpret it and react to it. Mm. So getting back to your question of, like, why did I choose a construction site? 
It's because it's a fascinating place that kind of shows us something about the future that could affect all of us. Okay, now I just got to find this place. Okay, that's a little bit terrifying to me because I feel like a construction site is so unpredictable and a lot could go wrong. Like, this is high stakes. These are high stakes environments. I don't think I would trust a robot to build my house. Yeah, well, I mean, to put it in perspective here, this robot isn't actually like swinging a hammer and pounding nails. Okay, good. <laughs> it's, it's basically a kind of manager. It tracks progress on construction. And it's actually doing the opposite of what you were worried about. It's making sure that people are safe. Okay, let me set the scene here. This is a big apartment tower being built by Skanska. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a construction company. And this is a pilot project that's taking place in Seattle to see how robots on a construction site will, will work. Wow. So there's a lot riding on what happens here. It's a 31-story building, and they're still pouring the concrete slabs on the top floors while the bottom floors are being finished, you know? That's crazy to me. I, I cannot comprehend how that works, but I, I trust you. <laughs> so right now, this building is just swarming with workers, you know? From a distance, they kind of look like ants. This may look like a ball of a million individuals, but make no mistake, the colony acts as one. But instead of, you know, hauling crumbs of bread around, they're installing aluminum studs and windows and plumbing fixtures and cooling ducts. These are insects that, by working together, transcend individual size. And of course, unlike ants, they have to be highly skilled and intelligent because, you know, construction workers have to do a lot of problem solving. Building a building is really complicated and, you know, if you could imagine a jigsaw puzzle, mm -hmm. if you laid out all the bits and pieces that go into making a building, all the little parts, there'd be thousands and thousands of parts. That would be a really big jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about all the times that I've tried to build like Ikea furniture, which is like arguably the easiest thing that you could ever build because the instructions are laid out for you. And it's like supposed to be really easy. And I just mess it up every single time. So I cannot imagine putting together a building like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and with Ikea furniture, too, you know, if you put things on in the wrong order, it, it doesn't work. You know? Yeah. I've learned that the hard way one too many times. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. On this construction site, that's where this robot comes in. Its name is Didge. And when I arrive in the early afternoon, the workers have mostly gone home for the day. And Didge is waking up. Yep, so currently right now what it's doing is it's loading up its mission for the specific floor. So it's loading up its maps and it's localizing itself on the floor and figuring out where it is. And it's planning the most efficient route to take throughout the floor based on its environment and the objects that are on the floor. That person who you hear is Jacob Riles. He's with a company called Nextera. That, that's the company that made the robot. The robot scoots around, you know, on its little tank treads, navigating around obstacles, sometimes climbing upstairs. And it takes photos of everything, you know, every closet, every bathroom, every hallway, just lots and lots and lots of photos. And so you'll have a complete photo history of every single floor and on the platform, just like Google Street View, you can jump from point to point to point and view your site virtually in almost real time. That's a lot of photos. It must have a lot of space on its little hard drive. I feel <laughs> like if I did that with my phone, it would fill up in like 10 minutes. <laughs> well, that's the thing with these robots. It's kind of hard to say where they're where their body begins and their brain ends. Oh my God, I can't, that's so creepy. I can't even think about that. <laughs> well, because right. the brain is sort of in the cloud, right? Oh, so wow. Okay. Yeah. E even though it's like separate from the robot, it's still part of its self. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> okay, but it, it's it's never crossed my mind that you have to take all these photos at a construction site. Like, why would you need to do that? Well, this is what construction management is all about. It's about lots of documentation to make sure the project is progressing on schedule and that workers are being safe and that the work is being done correctly, you know, and also documenting what's inside walls before you close them up. Hmm. I, I got a story about this. I mean, once <laughs> my wife got locked into a closet on a construction site because somebody installed a doorknob on backwards. Oh, my God. I have so many questions about that, but I'm not going to derail you. So <laughs> continue. And it's it's the kind of thing that a robot would be looking for. It would be looking for mistakes like that so that they could be corrected. <laughs> And what it actually does is it provides a heat map with location data. So you'll be able to see ex 
exactly where these safety observations are on the floor plan, and you'll be able to send up team members to rectify it. Wow. Okay. Is there... Oh, it's stopping. Maybe it... So it's, it's, it's kind of noticing us right now, and it's very hesitant. It's sensing a dynamic object, which is someone moving or maybe a scissor lift driving. I'm going to tell my wife I'm a dynamic object and see what she says. <laughs> we are dynamic objects to the robot, yes. <laughs> So that's what this robot does. It, it creates a record of everything that's going on. But it's not just a camera on wheels with a set route. It also understands what it sees. And it uses AI to compare what it sees to what it knows is supposed to be happening. And then it tells its human overlords where there's a problem. Like when the walls are in the wrong place. Or a doorknob is on backwards. <laughs> <laughs> or, or people aren't following the safety rules. Oh, so it knows when you're not following the rules. Yes. When we started in the construction office, mm -hmm. um, you guys had me put on protective gear. Mm -hmm. I have on this neon vest. Yep. If I had not been wearing this vest, would I show up as some kind of safety violation? Yes, it would. So if you weren't wearing your helmet, for example, uh, the robot would indicate an unsafe observation for personal protective equipment, specifically helmet. Would it recognize who was wearing the helmet wrong? You know, for example, would it know which worker is not wearing the No, gear? it's not gonna detect exactly which worker is doing it. And for example, on the privacy and you know safety side of things the person's face and body will actually be blurred and there are permissions and restrictions for who has access to that platform and, and this kind of work looking for safety violations and tracking the building's progress is a job a human used to do and actually that guy still works there what it's like when a robot takes your job after the break So I'm Garrett Metz. I'm a senior project engineer on uh, K Apartments. I chatted with Garrett a bit about, you know, what it's like when a robot takes over your work. Okay, can you walk me through what your job looked like back when you were doing the work that this robot is doing today? So before the robot, you'd have a full-time job just doing the day-to-day -day activities and managing subcontractors and, and managing meetings and, and being on phone calls and, and putting out fire drills. And then on top of that, you would have to come out here and walk the floors yourself, walk, stop, take the photo, upload to your phone, upload to the program, go to the next room, take the photo, etc. And I think we ran our own calculations in-house, and it's dozens of hours a week on top of your, your day job. How did you like that work? It uh, wasn't, very, wasn't very thrilling, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> I, yeah. I prefer kind of the problem solving, the team teamwork aspect of, of working through problems with engineers and architects and subcontractors and allowing me to to do that and 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 have the time to to work through those big big task items, big meetings, um, has been incredible in my opinion. So like for instance today we were in a meeting and we were going through uh, a list and things would come up, hey is this hole in this drywall in this room uh, patched and I'd pull up the photos sure enough the photo was taken a couple of days ago and sure enough the wall was patched so instead of me having to go out there with the photo camera every day tracking it um, by myself up on these floors after hours usually after all the crews are home um, I'm able to just pull it up in real time in meetings discuss it um, and, and use it as a tool for, for coordination. So what I'm hearing is you don't feel resentful that a robot has taken a portion of your job. Absolutely not. There's, there's plenty of work to go around for everyone. So as you think about the different kinds of jobs that robots with AI like this can do, um, what do you think it all means? I think that these robots and the AI are going to significantly help project teams be more efficient, um, alleviate some stress of a, a very stressful industry, and uh, allow us more time to be better spent on things that are, are better suited to, to humans, uh, better suited to a, a thinking mind, a working mind. I don't necessarily think it's gonna be replacing anybody's jobs anytime soon. I think, um, the construction industry as a whole is facing labor shortages across the board, um, and we've seen that for, for years now. 
in our mind, technology like this is a way to supplement the workforce that's already there um, and, and make their lives a lot better. Because it's taking hours of repetitive work off of your lap and um, putting it on the robot's lap. Yes. Yeah. The AI is really going to help my job and the superintendent's jobs really make sure the quality is still there um, and kind of facilitate building faster by able to find data faster and, and, and solving problems faster. Um, there's not going to be the delay of sifting through thousands and hundreds of thousands of documentations and drawings and it's going to help us lose that information much, much quicker. Okay, so I get what the robot's doing. It's doing the grunt work, like taking thousands of photos a day, <laughs> things that, you know, Garrett probably doesn't want to do. Um, and I get why it's not a threat to Garrett's job, because he can then start doing higher level stuff, like management stuff. Yeah, he basically got a promotion. <laughs> yeah, that's lucky for him. Yeah. But I, I feel like there's lots of other jobs on a construction site, like hammering in the nails, <laughs> like jobs that you might think of. Are those jobs safe from robots? Well, robots are really bad at swinging hammers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for one thing, every nail you hit is a little puzzle, you know? Like maybe it, maybe the nail hits a knot in the wood and it bends out of shape, and then you have to change your strategy. Maybe you got to straighten out the nail with a claw or, or pound it in from a different angle, you know? Humans are constantly doing this kind of adaptation. Sometimes it's as small as a nail, but sometimes it's much bigger you know, that, that may be why construction unions I've spoken to in Seattle say they're not worried yet. The head of one union here told me they're actually buying robots like the union is mm -hmm. so the workers can skill up and be ahead of the technology and be in charge of it. Yeah, that's really surprising to me that they're buying robots. So what I'm hearing is that the unions aren't worried because they think robots will never take those jobs. Well, they'd never say never. You know, but for now, they're not seeing a threat. That actually makes me feel a little bit better. But there is something else that I've been thinking about. Earlier on, you hinted at something bigger that's happening here, more than just robots helping people out. You suggested that robots could make humans smarter. What do you mean by that? Well, it's the same way that calculators made people smarter. You know, they're more precise and they can keep track of things and figure things out that we could probably figure out. But it's just easier to have a machine do it for us. I mean, how much did you get out of practicing long division problems over and over again in high school? Well, I was a nerd, so I actually <laughs> did love long division. I used to do it, like practice it while watching TV. But I will say that I, I probably haven't done a long division problem in like, I don't know, 12 years or something. So I don't think I got that much out of it. <laughs> or, or at least you're not returning to that exercise today no. just as a form of relaxation. <laughs> <laughs> well, calculators let you focus your mental energy on stuff stuff you'd rather be doing, you know, so that you can dream bigger. So architects can design more complicated visionary buildings because they can rely on robots to help them execute those visions with precision. And obviously this goes beyond construction. You know, many fields could be having these kinds of adv advancements from robots. But let's return to construction for a minute and that moment in time when my wife was trapped in a closet. I would love to return there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I used to work in architecture and back when I was in that field, you know, drawing buildings for a big building, I'd have to keep track of hundreds of different door types, you know, because every door has a different configuration of little windows inset in it, different doorknobs, different locks. Each door has a different swing direction and these would be tracked in this immense spreadsheet. It was it was so easy to mess things up. And, you know, it could be helpful having a robot there to double check the carpenter and maybe even like bring them the right doorknobs at the right time. <laughs> I'm sure your wife would have been happy about that. Yeah. So back to this 31 story building that we've been visiting today, you know, the director of innovation at the construction company there is this guy named Stuart Germain. And he made this really great analogy to the Matrix. I mean, I think buildings were previously created two-dimensionally with pen and paper or two-dimensional uh, drafting programs. And now what's the architects and engineers create a virtual 3D representation in the computer, in the cloud, of what the building is going to be. 
right? So it's just the same as a video game designer would do or a movie producer would do. They create a virtual world that exists based on certain rules. In architecture and construction, we have the real rules of gravity and things like that. And when we're taking that virtual representation and then creating a real live building out of it. And so robotics pulls into that. The, the DIG robot in particular helps the construction team and the architect team and the development team translate that virtual idea into built reality. Okay, so say I'm playing a video game and I see a world around me with buildings around me. It's as if that virtual world is then being sort of reconstructed in the real world. Yep, I think that's fair. I think that the thing that's in my mind too, thinking about the virtual versus reality is that one scene in the Matrix. What did you see? What happened? where the cat sort of appears and then fades away, and they're like, ooh, there's a glitch in the matrix. A deja vu is usually a glitch in the matrix. It happens when they change something. That's what the robot would be checking for, so make sure there's no glitches in the matrix. Make sure the walls are where they need to be, the drywall's in the right place, everything's like as it should be. There's no surprises in the construction process. There's no strange anomalies that aren't expected that portend some, uh, in matrix terms, some insertion of the bad guys that are coming to chase you down, right? Okay, so it's a good guy or a bad guy? The robot's a good guy for sure. Okay. You're empty. So are you. Yeah. It's really about getting consistent, clear information to the right people at the right time. And that's, well, that'll make things, construction go faster, safer, more clean, and therefore all of those things also save money. So there's a benefit to being able to build housing faster, being able to, you know, uh, rent space at a, at, a, at a more market uh, affordable rent, right? Because you're trying to balance off how much it costs to be able to build buildings in today's environment. So what I'm hearing is that this robot, because it's more advanced and is using AI, is able to help humans better bridge the divide between their imagination, what they want the buildings to look like, and the reality, what the buildings are actually looking like. Yeah, and that's why this robot is named DIG. It stands for Digital Bridge. Oh, okay. It all makes sense now. Yeah, so it's bridging that divide, just like you said. Yeah, and and so DIG is helping to execute more complicated visions and make the building at a faster pace with fewer mistakes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, sometimes people fear that robots will take their jobs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's true, you know. But the fear is rooted in thinking that robots are becoming more human-like. Yeah, I think that was my fear in the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. But at least in this case, these robots are leaning into the things that robots are inherently good at. You know, the precision. And... And that allows us humans to lean into what we're inherently good at so that we can maximize our potential. This is all sounding a little bit too good to be true. <laughs> I, f I feel like there's got to be some downsides here. What are we not seeing? Well, I mentioned that the construction union isn't concerned at this point, but inevitably, like I said, robots will replace some jobs, mm -hmm. you know, starting with repetitive jobs in predictable environments. But as we discussed, because of AI, increasingly you're going to see robots in chaotic environments and some of those jobs will disappear. And in every industry, there's going to be a different line be between what robots can take on and what they can't. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how that's going to play out everywhere. Yeah, I, I kind of I want to stop here and like push back a little bit because I feel like we're always trying to get more efficient and get more productive as humans. And like robots are obviously helping us do that. But I'm, I'm remembering back to my history class in high school and we learned about like the first industrial revolution and this transition from people making things by hand to using machines. And it was like so great because we were doing it faster and being more productive. But my teacher had us answer this question that was like, was this advancement actually progress? And I, I feel like a broken record because we like talk about this constantly. <laughs> but I, I this makes me think of that. Like, what if I don't want to start using robots or AI? What if I don't care about being fast and efficient? What if I just want to keep doing things by hand the old fashioned way? Yeah, well, you know, you still have a choice in, mm -hmm. for example, whether you want to like 
knit by hand. You I know? love knitting, so that's great. <laughs> nobody's nobody's forcing a robot on you that will do that for you. I and, hope not. And, and, you know, of course, when you talk, bring up the Industrial Revolution, we have to acknowledge that there were environmental costs to that decision, mm-hmm. too. And so we can't ignore those externalities. But, you know, I, I love that you brought up the Industrial Revolution because in some ways it's a moment very much like this one where we are with robots and AI because it was this time when just everything was changing in terms yeah. of how we made things. And that in, get, actually gave rise to a major artistic movement, mm. the arts and crafts movement, for example, which later evolved into Art Nouveau, was this idea that because machines can do everything sort of efficiently, like an assembly line, like people had to sort of rethink, what is it to be human? What is mm. it for, for us to celebrate something as as a work of art or craftsmanship? And you actually saw this idea of craftspeople kind of rising up out of that. It's like, th- this is actually something with honor and dignity because mm. when a craftsperson is working with wood, for example, they're listening to the wood and if it has knots in it or whatever they're kind of carving around it and in the arts and crafts movement they would make sort of wood block cuts out of this and stamp out um, a piece of art over and over again but it still centered the hand of the artist Mm -hmm. and that is because people were sort of redefining themselves in terms of we are not machines Mm -hmm. you know and I'm actually super excited to see what kind of artistic movements arise out of this moment that we're in right now with AI and with robots. Like, how will people define themselves differently once again, you know, different than the machines? So do you think that robots will never replace human, I don't know, artistic? Artistic genius? Yeah, artistic genius. Well, here's the thing. I think we will move the goalposts on what artistic genius means so that it is reserved for humans. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I I was feeling pretty jaded at the start of this episode, but I feel like I'm feeling a little bit more hopeful. Uh, So I've got a surprise for you in our end game, and this still has to do with robots. Excellent. That's coming up next. We are now the first ever robot human duet in the history of the Tonight Show. Ruth. See something I'm giving up on you. We're back, and I've got an end game for you. Usually I share it with you and Monica, but unfortunately she's on maternity leave, so it's just and you. She just had a baby. Yes, she did. Congratulations. Yay. Congratulations, Monica. Monica. We miss you. Um, okay, so I sent out a question to our listeners. If you could have a personal AI robot to assist you in your life, what would you have it do? We got a lot of responses. <laughs> so I'm going to share them with you, and then I'm going to have you answer that question too. Okay, so I sorted our responses into three categories because they basically sorted themselves, actually. One category was things around the house, like manual labor. Uh So Christine said, I would have my robot organize everything I own and also take out the garbage. (laughs) Um, Eileen said, if I had a robot, I would use it to fetch things for me because I have limited mobility. Uh And Chelsea said, my personal robot would hang up the clothing on my clothes chair. (laughs) It it, it amazes me how much these sound like um, the labor-saving ideas for robots from the Jetsons. Yeah, that's funny. (laughs) A few other things that came up in this, like, house manual labor section were vacuuming, cleaning, cooking, doing the dishes, piano tuning, sorting the recycling, all those tasks around the house that you don't really want to do yourself. Yeah. Okay, so the next section or the next uh, category is gardening. (laughs) Oh, I I thought people did gardening because they liked it. Someone said that they wanted the robot to scoot around the garden and find all the blackberry, bindweed, and other specified weeds so that they could be pulled out. But they don't want the robot to do the pulling. 
wow. Oh, they want to do the actual polling themselves. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, I have a little app on my phone called Seek. And it identifies plants for me. So it could, you know, I could point it at blackberries and it could say that you could you could give that task to a robot who would sort of scoot around your garden. I don't know why you'd want to pull blackberry shoots out <laughs> yourself. <laughs> that doesn't compute for me. But. I know. But that that is interesting. It's like the robot is doing the mind labor of like trying to figure out where all these weeds are. And then you're doing the physical labor that like feels good when you're in the garden. That, that must say why people like this kind of repetitive work of gardening maybe there is still a place in our lives for that kind of like zen like activity to sort of clear our minds yeah so the third category was like project management and scheduling people's lives okay this is what robots well ai is good at at least and if you add a physical component a robot could help with that yeah elizabeth said record keeping and taxes sam said making appointments and waiting on hold um, when you're like searching for travel dates and other things. And then Ellen said helping to navigate healthcare for her family, which is a huge one that I didn't even think about. But it's like organizing your appointments and follow ups and medications and insurance. And then also like all the preventative care that we don't really get around to because it involves too many random phone calls and all that stuff. She would have her AI robot do that for her. Interesting. The most physical thing that you described in there was like managing medications potentially. Mm. I'm thinking like, you know, my parents uh, were taking care of their medication for them now because they can't do it for themselves anymore. And I have this little, basically a little robot wheel that spins around and dispenses their pills and oh my gives them a little alarm and says, it's time for your morning pills or it's time for your evening pills. Yeah. And if you combine that with AI yeah. so that a robot could both be dispensing the medication, but also like you know, figuring out changes in medication as they yeah. came in from the doctor or whatever, that that could get pretty interesting. Yeah. So that I think is a really important kind of like distinction from uh, old robots to like these new AI robots is like doing the physical thing, but then also taking in information and changing what they're doing to the physical thing. Yeah. Mark had an idea that kind of is along these lines, which is making suggestions about activities for children relevant to their development and based on like input about personalities. And then also he said his AI robot would have separate points of view for each member of the family and present three options for courses of action when decision making suggestions are offered. (laughs) (laughs) So that is like going above and beyond. (laughs) Yeah. And then I have to mention the few people who said that they don't want AI or robots involved in their lives at all. Jan said, if I had a personal AI robot, I would set it to seek out all the other AI robots and destroy them. Oh, no. (laughs) So, (laughs) got to mention that. (laughs) Yeah, so there's some some judgment there, but you're you're welcome to that. Yeah. Okay, Joshua, if you could have a personal AI robot to assist you in your life, what would you have it do? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mentioned taking care of my uh, parents' medications. Obviously... Like, I still want to socialize with my parents. Yeah. But honestly, when I go over with them now, so much of my time is spent with logistics Mm. um, that I sometimes feel like I don't have enough time to just sit with them and look at old pictures of the family photos, for example. So I wouldn't mind a robot taking over the pill management and then maybe even also other kinds of management, such as making sure that they have enough Metamucil, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> and then I could just sit with them on the couch and like just hang out. And there's this stress with, you know, helping your adult parents between like the tasks yeah. and and the visiting and, the you know, loving them. And, and this would relieve some of that stress. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And I'm I'm not in your situation, but when I think about my grandparents, um, it it does though make me feel good to actually help them with those tasks like Mm -hmm. more even more than just sitting with them it's like if I'm helping you like do your dish or make your tea like that act of service it gives me something a lot so I don't know if I would want to to pass that over to a robot because it's like the, the actual act of doing that thing is what makes me feel good yeah that's a really good point I mean sometimes we don't necessarily understand the full value of something until we've had to live you know Mm. without it for a little while deep 
(laughs) (laughs) With that, should we turn to the credits? Let's turn to the credits. Well, that's it for Booming. Do you have a question about the economy? You can email us at booming at kuw.org. We've been getting some great emails and we love seeing them come in. So please keep using the email address. Special thanks to Hans Twite for production support and Alex Rochester from our community engagement team for helping to collect all of your personal AI robot ideas. (laughs) And thanks to all you listeners who are supporters of KUOW. You know, on the radio, we do a pledge drive where we ask for your support. And in the podcast, we reserve that for, you know, here at the end. (laughs) Right now. You (laughs) you listen to the podcast now, support KUOW. (laughs) Go to KUOW.org slash donate slash booming. And thank you. Our producer is Whitney Henry Lester. Our editor is Carol Smith. I'm Lucy Suchak. And I'm Joshua McNichols. And we'll see you next time.